Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Peters. I'm home in my office, but in theory, this is the poison pen. And it's really a pleasure to launch Reese Bowen's newest romantic systems book, The Venice Sketchbook. And as you can see from the little label, um, Reese has already autographed all our copies. It doesn't go on sale till Tuesday, but um, it's not too late to order one. And it's really exciting. This is the hardcover, but I should add that there is also a um, paperback edition of it simultaneously. So if, um, if you want to choose that one, you could do that as well. So welcome, Reese. Hello, hello, Barbara. It's, it's the launch party, so it's not champagne because it's the middle of the afternoon, but it's my, oh, you've got one too. I my do. I was going to drink a toast to you. Absolutely. <clears throat> and let me, show, so, let me show you something you showed the book. Did you, have you seen inside the cover? Why don't you show us? If you take the outside cover off, look what's there. Isn't that gorgeous? It's St. Mark's, right? Yeah, it, it, and the sketch is mine. <coughs> is it really? Yeah, I, when, when, we, when we were talking about covers, I said, do you want to take a look at the sketches I do? And I, so I sent, one of, I sent, sent my sketches and, and she said, oh, we love this one. We're going to do it, we're going to use it somehow. And, so you take off the cover and there it is. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. It's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. And her, <clears throat> excuse me, is the title page that Reese has signed. Yeah. So everybody will know it's authentic. Sadly, Reese is not in Venice, but rather <laughs> here in Venice. <laughs> but, but let's talk about, we brought a little touch of Italy to this performance. So I am wearing my, if you can see them, my glass earrings that I bought on Lake Como, they had um, a beautiful glassworks shop. And in general, I wanted to look as though I were out for a night in Venice in 1928, which is where this book begins. But Reese has got even more exciting jewelry. It, it, this is my Murano glass. It doesn't, doesn't do it justice because it's so sparkly, really. It's sort of got, got gold in each of them. But these are Murano glass beads from the island of Murano, which is and the next to Venice, one of the islands next to Venice. And you can go there and you can watch them blowing glass. And um, my heroine covets some beads and finally buys herself some in the middle of the book and, and, and leaves the two to uh, her, her, great, um, her great niece. So, they, so Murano glass pictures in the, in the story. It does indeed. Now there's um, the only time that I was in Venice some years ago, it was June and it was so hot you could barely breathe and so crowded, you, you were elbowing your way along. Yeah. So my husband and I decided that the way to solve that was to take the Vaporetti, one Vaporetto, yeah. and cruise around the islands in the lagoon through the breeze and whatever. Yeah. Murano is the glass island. Burano is famous or was famous, if I remember right, for lace making. Is that right? And Torcello too. Torcello was the other. Right. Thing. And, and of course, there's some wonderful mosaics. And then there's the cemetery island. Um, so, so um, yeah, Venice is, is, um, is wonderful in the waterways, not just the canals in the city, but the other waterways are um, a lot of fun to explore. But tell us, because I love your opening scene. So you have this young woman. Wait, you know what? Let me, let me stop a minute and let's make an announcement because I meant to do this and I'm afraid I'm going to forget. Reese is the author of um, two best-selling series, the, Her Royal Spinus, Lady Georgie, and before that, the Molly Murphy series in addition to these wonderful standalones that she's now writing. But she has an important announcement to make about Molly Murphy. Well, every week I get letters saying, when is there going to be another Molly book? We're missing Molly. And I've had to say, you know, I, I only have two hands. I can't, I can't write any faster than I am and I can't fit it in right now. Well, this year there is going to be, well, no, early next year, another Molly book coming out because I am co-writing now with my wonderful daughter, Claire, who is a brilliant writer. And she was the one, she came to me and she said, you know, I think we could do Molly together. I think I could do a really good job. So I said, okay, let's see. She came up with a really terrific idea for the first book. And I was expecting to have to hold her hands, you know, and say, well, we need a little more tension here. And we don't, she just took it and run with it. She'd say, well, I've handled the party scene. And then the three scenes after that, and I go, Brilliant. And she really, I can't tell now which was mine and which was hers if I look through 
and, and that's a real big compliment to her. So it was a joy to write with her. And so now the series is going to continue and we have the next one coming out early next year and it's called Wild Irish Rose. And Claire's, Love the title. Yeah, Claire's brilliant idea was that we should mirror her own experience coming to Ellis Island. What if another young woman like Molly comes to Ellis Island and there's a murder while she's there and no one will believe her. And Molly, of course, knows, went through her own experience. So she's determined to prove her innocence. So that's, that's the start of this, this next story. It's, it's a really good one. It's a wonderful start. What year are you in, Reese? Uh, 1907. Okay, so we're not motoring along too fast through the no, turn no, of the 20th century. We're actually only two months after the last one, which was Ghost of Christmas Past. I said to Claire, you know, if we get really fed up with this, there is the Titanic in, in 1911, we can put her on that. That's a, that's a cruel thought, but you're <laughs> absolutely right. She could, but then of course she'd have to decide if she'd be one of the survivors or, yeah, yeah. or not, yeah. uh, because not, not everybody actually died on the Titanic. Uh, it, was, it was the steerage passengers, unfortunately, that did because there were no lifeboats. Right. No, it, it was awful. But let me think, is that going to be the 19th Molly Murphy? 18th. 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 Yeah. That's, a, that's just amazing that, you know, you have written so many of those along with all of these other books. But you mm -hmm. must be delighted to be able to um, continue it without doing the whole load yourself. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm really glad to bring her back. I was, I knew I couldn't do three books a year. And so, you know, Claire has taken the load off my shoulders and having proved in this first book, how well she can, how well she can handle it. You know, I will step back more and more and, and just be like a, a mentor. So that will be good. I think it's fascinating that, because I know you've told me this um, before we're talking today, that when you read through it, you couldn't work out who wrote what. No, I couldn't, no, no. And she couldn't either. She said, you know, that the other day, she said, that scene was so-and-so, was that my scene? And I said, I'm really not sure. So, you know, that, that's, that's a compliment to both of us, I think, that we, we both, she picked up Molly's voice instantly, which was really good. That is wonderful. And now, before we talk, let me, one more thing. When is the next Royal Spinus book slated to come out? Oh, yeah, that's coming out in October. And um, it's a Christmas book. My Berkeley begged me to do another Christmas book, which they're such fun to do. Right. But this one takes place at Sandringham, where the royal family are having Christmas. And um, uh, it's a lovely English Christmas of the best sort with crackling fires and holly and Christmas puddings, uh, just with the addition of a few bodies. So. Um, <laughs> Well, the last one you had 12 clues, so you know, we were following. I'm going to kill off 12 people this time. That was quite a challenge to kill them all off in the correct way on the right day of Christmas. You know, this one's not quite as many bodies, and it's called God Rest Ye Royal Gentlemen. Oh, that's a wonderful title, and sadly, very appropriate today with the death of Prince Philip yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Well, and also, actually, in the book I'm writing, it's Christmas 1905. So of course, in January, King George is gonna die. So I'm very aware of that when I'm writing the book. Wait, January, 1935, right? 1935, yeah, sorry, yeah, right, sorry. Right. Wrong since, yeah. I've moved ahead, right? 1935, <laughs> yes. So he's, King George is gonna die in the middle of January. And then of course, uh, the Prince of Wales is gonna take the throne and we're gonna have the whole Mrs. Simpson drama and, um, so that's, you know, that's lurking in a, a next book or so. Well, you're going to love writing that because you've been trailing after Mrs. Simpson oh, for yeah. many books. So. But the only thing is once she, you know, once she's, he's stepped down and she's gone, how do I bring her into my books? If you, of course, I can bring her into a wonderful one when they go to Germany. Wouldn't that be fun? It would. No, there's a lot of possibility yeah. there. And, you know, thinking about it and thinking about all that drama of, you know, nearly a century ago with Mrs. Simmons and then thinking about the drama of the royal family at the moment with another <laughs> American. Um, and it makes you wonder, you know, how people will look back and view where we are now in 50 yeah. years and, and what we will have to, and what, you know, I, I wish I were younger because there's so many things that I would love to live long enough to find out <laughs> what goes on, but not gonna happen, <laughs> yeah. right? So what? now, finally, the Venice sketch. <laughs> yep, there we go. Um, you you have really loved doing these um, these romantic suspense books. Um, 
like me, I think, aren't you a great fan of Mary Stewart and Victoria Holt and books yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and more recently, Kate Morton. I love yes. like the early, the Forgotten Garden and the Secret Keeper. Um, uh, and what I love is books where you are in two or three time periods and you have a story in the present and the story in the past and they're parallel and you get, it's like peeling away the onion. You get tiny little snippets of what might have happened until you can put it together in both of them. That's, that's really fun to write. It is fun to write and you have a particular fondness for World War II stories. Um, your, your timeline often yeah. pivots around events in the war. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the idea, the germ behind this book happened uh, long ago when my aunt was, I have a very prim and proper aunt, a very English spinster, and um, she used to go to Italy a lot, but she went to Venice every single Easter. And when I was a sort of romantic teenager, I remember thinking, why does she go every Easter? Why, I wonder if she meets someone there. What if she met someone there and we never knew about him? So there, that, that was long ago. But what gave me the impetus this time was I was in Venice a couple of years ago and we went to the Biennale, which is the huge open air uh, art festival where all the different countries have a pavilion and you just walk around through the Giardini and there are all the pavilions. There. And I found out that it had been held in 1940 and in 1942. And I thought, who went? The world was at war. You know, was it just the Germans going down to Italy in 1940? Uh, certainly wasn't the Russians in 1942. So, you know, so I was very intrigued and I thought it'd be interesting to write something about Venice still having its classic art exhibitions when the whole rest of the world was at war. So that's what, that's what started this. What a, what a really intriguing thought. I didn't realize, I mean, I've, I've been to the Biennale that one time that I was in Venice and it was very modern, had, you know, lots of light tubes and video and, yeah. you know, that yeah. sort of yeah. modern art, but I didn't think it ever occurred to me that they were hosting it during the war. No, I mean, it, it doesn't, I mean, I can imagine 1940 still because uh, America hadn't entered the war. So maybe there was an American pavilion the Russians were still on the side of the Germans. And um, of course, Italy and Germany had teamed up. So there were enough people to go to it. But 1942, there was nobody. There were, there'd be, there were German pictures of handsome peasants in the fields making hay, you know, that was about it. And part of the story has to deal with someone like Paul Clay, who is Jewish and is no longer welcome in Germany and who has, um, you know, is taking his art elsewhere now. And so, so Venice, because both sides agreed not to bomb. So there you had this little oasis of calm and serenity and art in the middle of a crazy war. And the Venetians by nature are very tolerant. So the Jews had a very easy time to start with. They weren't forced to wear the yellow star. Um, they kept a low profile, but nobody didn't think. It was only when Italy changed sides and the Germans came in and took Venice, that suddenly there were these terrible reprisals. And so, you know, that's what my story's about. Well, Venice is the home of the original ghetto, which is, yeah. um, it was an old iron foundry yeah. and the Jews were, I have been through that. There are still, I'm trying to remember how many synagogues within, yeah. at least three, I'm thinking five for some reason, but I might be wrong. But in any case, um, you know, a, a contained part of the city and they could close the gates and, yeah. um, and keep them inside. And that, I think, goes all the way back to, what, the 14th century or something? 13th? Okay. Really, really good restaurants in that part of the city because it's off the tourist route and therefore they're very laid back. And a lot of them, you just sit on the sidewalk outside the restaurant and they'll bring you the, like this, the, the spaghetti with the seppi with the... Um, octopus ink, you know, and things. So it's a good place to eat. Right. But I mean, a city with a very long tradition of housing um, its Jewish citizens. So, you know, the war yeah. and the whole Holocaust thing would have been a tremendous um, trauma. But yeah. you opened the book in 1928. So, and that's a really nice scene. So why don't you tell us, well, there are no spoilers going to be involved here. Why don't you yeah. tell us about oh. how the book opens? Well, we start off the book in 1928 when Juliet Browning, known as Letty to her family, 
is taken to Venice by her very prim and proper aunt, who I have to say, I'm channeling Aunt Gladys when I write this. Um, she comes out of the station and she says, Echo il canale grande. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly as my aunt would have said it. Um, um, so she takes she takes Juliet to Italy for her 18th birthday. And of course, Juliet at that time is wide eyed and hopeful and looking forward to going to art school, wants to be a painter. And the world seems to be open for her. And she has a chance to go off sketching on her own uh, and sees a box floating past and hears noises coming from it and realizes it's a box full of kittens that they've thrown in to drown. So of course, being a young English girl, she jumps in to save them, only to realize when she's put them up on the, on the uh, walkway that there are no steps, there's no way up. So there she is, she's stuck in the canal and could easily drown. And she's, she tries to think what the Italian word for help is. Um, <laughs> and she tries to remember her Latin class, would it be the same? Um, but then uh, a motorboat comes past and the driver of the motorboat spots her and pulls her out. And he says, you must be English. And she says, how did you know? And he says, only an English girl would be stupid enough to go swimming in a canal. Um, so that's how she meets Leonardo, um, who is a dashing and as we find out, a very rich, very, very powerful Italian. And um, the story continues throughout the whole book. Well, I mean, they're both very young. Yeah. Um, and I love, I love the way that she, I mean, this is not a spoiler because we're once again in the opening scene, um, despite her aunt's strictures, she really wants to explore the city and not just sit in the hotel and have tea and, you know, be English yeah. uh, while they're there. So, um, she has a rendezvous, an innocent one with this yeah. young man. And to do that, she has to what? Climb out of her hotel room, right? She does, yeah. I mean, can you imagine, I mean, wouldn't you go? If you, were, you were very, uh, you know, you're 18 years old and you're in Italy and aunt, aunt says, this is what my aunt said, a lady never goes out after dinner unescorted. So that's what my aunt said. So they're sitting in the hotel after dinner. They go up to bed and then she hears uh, 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 something thrown at her shutters of her window and, she, and there, there he is in his boat down below and he helps her climb out. I mean, I would have gone too. Um, Absolutely. Um, my, yeah. first, my first visit to Italy, I was 15 and traveling with my grandmother and uh, I wasn't quite as brave as, well, actually I was. Anyway, let's say that I too ventured out um, yeah. and nothing, nothing terrible happened. Um, yeah. It was... You know, it was an interesting time where he's thinking about it because it was 1955 and Europe had not been able yet to recover from the war. You know, I mean, uh, so much damage in, in the major cities. London eventually was able to rebuild the East End. I've been to Hamburg, which was, you know, flattened and is now um, thriving much of Germany. But in 1955, yeah. There was, um, the war was, the traces of it were absolutely yeah. everywhere. I went across for the first time, my first time in Europe, I went across to stay with friends in Vienna um, in 1954. And it had just split between, you know, it was, it was one of those cities, it was between the, um, the Russians, the English and the Americans all had a part of Vienna. They just moved out. So Vienna was pretty much just sort of emerging. And there were things like, we went to this little, little castle in the middle of a lake and the Russians had been there and they had slashed, they'd had leather, leather embossed walls, they'd slashed all the leather walls. So things like that, just senseless violence and destruction everywhere. So the, the Venetian, you know, the, 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 the Venice, uh, uh, I mean, the um, Vienna, uh, Viennese were still uh, very much suffering from the war. I was lucky because I was on a farm. So we had plenty to eat and everything, but I gather not everybody did. So I, when you think of it, I think I was 12 going on 13 and they put me on a train in London and I went to Vienna by myself. But you know, that's what I was going to say is that it, in many ways, it was a much more innocent time despite all the ravages of war and the violence, the horrible things that happened. I never, um, I never felt like I was going to be in, in any danger if I, you know, stepped out after after my grandmother went to bed um, and, you know, with company, I don't know that I would have gone out by myself 
um, I was fortunate that, you know, I was with other people. I think it probably would have been truly foolhardy to have stepped out into the streets at age 15, you know, at night yeah. without yeah. anybody. But um, I, I didn't think, I mean, I don't know. I have, I'm thinking back, growing up north of Chicago in the suburbs, I had a really feral childhood by today's standards. We didn't think anything of taking off on our bikes after breakfast and coming home after dark. Nobody knew there wasn't any GPS or tracking or cell phones or anything. Nobody knew where you were. Um, and you always felt like you could ask adults for help if you needed to. And, you know, it was just, it's astonishing to me how much it's changed in the last yeah. however many years it's been, 60 anyway, close to 70 now. I mean, exactly the same thing. I lived out in the middle of the country. Um, I'd get on my bike and my mother would say, come back before it's dark. They never said, where are you going? They never said, you go, who are you going with? It just, we went out, you know, and, and the fact that they could trust me go across Europe on a train and people in my carriage would see a young girl alone and they'd offer me some salami and, you know, we were, it was all, all and I think even in, in Italy and then later in Greece, men would flirt. Men might even pinch your bottom. Yes. It was harmless. It was like a, a scoring point and you never felt in that very bad danger. In Italy, we got, um, I mean, in, in Greece, when I was about 18, 19, first year of college, a friend and I went with a backpack for three months around Greece and everywhere we went, they didn't allow their own women out at all. People would try and pick us up. You come with me, you beautiful girl, you know, but they took, when you said no, that was that, you know, it was, um, uh, they, there was a limit and you I know we were in a bus station once we got rather good by the end of three months and a man came up and he said I like your friend you tell her she spent tonight with me so I called all the way down the bus station Ruth he says would you like to spend tonight with him and she went no thank you <laughs> and he crept away well, oh, yeah, uh, I remember having a very sore butt um, and uh, during a train ride because, you know, they would go by and sort of pinch. It wasn't a me too time either. I mean, you know, there was not that instant outrage that um, I think people would feel today. But anyway, I brought all that up because I understand why Letty would have, you know, um, would have gone over down, down the wall and yeah. um, and sailed off with um, Leonardo yeah. or, yeah. you know, their evening picnic and all the rest of it and and it wouldn't it wouldn't have felt dangerous no well, and then her aunt of course totally overreacts because naturally she's a spied by somebody um the yeah. lady for yeah. having dropped over the wall and her aunt is just beyond outraged and yeah. jerks her away from venice and what a shame you know because it really could have been so different if if um yeah there'd been more tolerance on the end's part. But in any case, so that's where we start. And then Letty comes back to Venice, what, 10 years later? Yes, she does. I mean, her life in 10 years is not what she thought it was gonna be. She thinks she's gonna to go to art college and then maybe make her mark as an artist and then everything changes. The first scene is 1928. So we have 1929, the great crash. Right. Family loses money, father who has been sick since the great war eventually dies and so mother very dependent mother and Letty has to drop out of college and get a job to look after her mother so she thinks her world has shrunk to this little village looking after mother teaching at a girls school but she gets a chance to take the girls to Venice on a cultural holiday so she jumps at it and she goes back to Venice never expecting to see Leo again and then does bump into him and we go from there, but but much of the story takes place decades later, yeah. Um, yeah. And and not through Letty's eyes, but through the eyes of what is it, her niece, a great niece, Caroline. Great niece. Okay. Yeah. yeah so the, the 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 other story, it's really two women with parallel lives because her great niece Caroline, when we find her, it starts in two thousand and one with the twin towers coming down. Um, and Caroline has also not had the life she thought she was going to have. She has been to art college she, uh, and she studied fashion design and she's very talented. And she marries another student uh, because she's pregnant. And suddenly her life is confined to being a mom, having a rather menial job while her husband is still madly creating 
and goes off to America to compete in a, in a, in a competition, meets someone else and, um, uh, and dumps Caroline. So Caroline finds herself dumped. And what's more, he, their, their child is over there and it looks as if he's trying to keep their child. So that's where Caroline starts the story. Wow, you really like to torture these women. <laughs> well, yeah. um, you know, I, if a life is going smoothly, there's not much to write about. So, but, sure. you know, it's sad to think about, um, you know, someone young with life opening up and full of promise and then circumstances um, intervene and yeah. the dreams they had are are frustrated or cut short. So then the real question is, is there a second chance for them or a second chance for not the life maybe they envisioned, but but a life that they will enjoy that goes on a different track. Well, and that's the, that's the other parallel. Letty gets a second chance of sorts, which doesn't turn out well, as we know. But Caroline also is, through her great aunt, is given that second chance. And one has to think that the great aunt wanted her to have that second chance because Caroline goes to her great aunt as she's dying. She's now a woman of over 90 and she's dying. And she insists that Caroline take a box, small cardboard box. And inside there are three keys and a sketchbook of Venice. So Caroline thinks that what her aunt wants is for her to scatter her ashes in Venice. And um, nobody's ever known before that she even had a life in Venice. So, Caroline goes to Venice to scatter the ashes, and then, of course, she finds out what the keys open. And I can say no more, as I'd have to keep No, 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 no. <laughs> but, you know, you, you really like this structure. You have written, I think, Farleyfield stayed, didn't it stay really in the same yes, time? It, yes, yeah. It, Farleyfield was much more thriller, and we have a fairly compressed timeline, and you're counting down all the time to find out what, what the secret is. But the Tuscan child was exactly like this. You had someone in the present and someone in the past, and you went back between the two of them. And you had the the effect of the war, you know, how it yes. how it changed lives so dramatically. And what is it about World War II that fascinates you so much? I sp well, one thing I was born in the middle of it. Um, I I don't remember much because um, uh, I was I, I think I, I was I wasn't even three when it ended. But um, it's in my psyche. I um, I still react badly if I hear a siren go off. You know, one of those woo. And still, if I see searchlights, my heart rate goes up. Um, so, and I knew apparently when I was one, I knew the difference in sound between our planes and enemy planes. And if I heard enemy planes in the distance, I had to get my little wooden stool and go and sit behind one of the big oak doors so that if the glass blew in, the glass wouldn't blow all over me. So, you know, survival mode very early on. I think what really fascinates me is it's the last occasion where we actually have a case of good versus evil. You know, every war since then, the Vietnam, uh, all the, uh, Iraq, Kuwait, they've all been tinged with gray. Are we doing the right thing? Are we not doing the right thing? You can argue both ways. Um, but World War II was clearly, this is a monster who will swallow the world. And if we do not stop him, you know, it will be the end of us. So I think everybody felt they had to do their part. And most people sacrificed tremendously, were anxious to join the army, went off, did very brave things. And there were a few people who betrayed. There were a few people who made a lot in the black market. So you had the very good and the very bad. And you had people you thought would be ordinary, decent people who were suddenly called upon to do things that were terrible. And to start with, they resisted. And after a while, it became second nature. And you think of someone who became a guard at a prison camp, you know, one of the concentration camps in Germany. A lot of those went home to their wives and kids at night. How could they do that? But they did. So, you know, at analyzing what makes a person act the way they do in a war like that, that time of heightened emotion, of heightened duty, what would make you choose to risk danger? Letty risks tremendous danger. What would make her do that? Why would she not just not say, thanks, I don't think this is for me, but she does. So, you know, it's, it's yeah. interesting to see how people handle war. Absolutely. Um, and in the, in the current wave of books set in World War II, 
um, the majority of them right now are women's stories. Um, you know, after the war, there were a lot of a lot of thrillers, Alistair MacLean, The Guns of Navarone, books like that, um, where you were really looking at the military operations and you know fighting men and you know the bridges over the river Kwai. I mean, you're, we've been talking really about the European theater, but the Asian theater, the Japanese theater, was one of the things that made the war so horrendous. It really was global with that with that access with Germany and Japan. Um, yeah, we had we have John has family members, two of them who were in the prisoner of war camp in in uh, Singapore. You know where they starved people to death. They came home like skeletons. So, you know, we that, that's very. I'm very aware of all that. I just don't have the expertise to write about that. I know I know Europe very well. So, you know, that's easy for me to write about. But I have no expertise in, in what would be to write about a Japanese psyche or anything. That's, very foreign and, and no, I wasn't suggesting that you would. You know, my author, Sulari Gentle, whose books you've read and whose books, like me, you, you like, yeah. um, has made me aware of the Australian in, um, theater during the 30s. And, you know, the same forces that were at work in Europe yeah. were very much at work, but we're not that familiar with them. You know, we I didn't know much about fascism in Australia or... Mm -hmm communism or you know the far right or the or the left or or whatever yeah. um we tend to focus on on what's familiar um or or where we have resources to study or to read it but i mean it really was a global war there oh, yes. was nowhere that wasn't um involved in it but i do think it's interesting that there are all kinds of stories about um women's lives whether you know whatever work they were doing you've written you wrote one about um the the land girls you know the, yeah, yeah. That which was one was that one, uh, the victory garden that one was one, right. one but it was the same it, it was the same thing of women being called to do things they didn't think they were could do um and i think you know all the heroism of world war ii was given to men and it's only fairly recent. I mean, look at the women pilots in America, the ones who flew those giant planes across the country. And if those planes crashed, they, they even had to pay, the family had to pay to have their bodies shipped back. They weren't even given a proper funeral because they weren't officially in the military. So, I mean, women, women did so much. And the Bletchley Park women, the Bletchley Park women who probably saved God knows how many convoys across the Atlantic. Nobody knew about them until fairly recently. So I think finally, and, and, and the worst of all were the young women who were parachuted into France as spies. Their chance of survival was probably at like 25%. And, yeah. yet, and yet they kept on volunteering to do it. But so, there were also women, you know, on the home front. I mean, people had to raise food. People had to, you know, had to cook and school children and provide medical care. Um, there's a really interesting, years ago, I remember reading a book by John Lawton called Blackout, which is set in London. And it was really about the difficulties of policing during, yeah. um, during the war, because um, you know somebody still needed to maintain civilian law and order. And, and that was hard because if he wasn't in, in a fighting uniform, people tended to do that World War I thing, you know, with a white feather and why aren't you? Absolutely, yes, yeah. But in point of fact, it was necessary to have somebody maintaining stability and law and order. So I think what we're finding now is, is the ordinary lives, you know, um, keeping the library going or, you know, that kind of thing. A lot of quiet heroism, not the, not the thrilling, you know, landing on the beach and assaulting caves and shooting planes out of the sky or whatever, but people who kept life going. Um, so that um, you know, so that everybody who could would survive. Well, yeah, my mother was a teacher and had to keep on teaching all through the war because obviously um, the men weren't there. Um, but she had to do her share of fire watching, which meant you had to spend a night on the roof of the school walking up and down. So that if some sort of incendiary bomb dropped on the roof, you had to go and stamp it out before it, <laughs> before it caught fire to the school. I mean, things like that were not easy. No, no, I'm sure. And, and, you know, I'm sure there was an omnipresent sense of danger. So, I mean, you could never really escape it. 
wherever you were. Um, I mean, we were lucky here in America because we were not an actual war theater. So while we sent people to fight and terrible things happened and there were you know, deprivations in civilian life, we didn't actually have to worry about troops storming into the village or you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But I think I think the Venice sketchbook is a really um, it's a wonderful look at the city in ways that it has not been portrayed very often. So you know, since you're so fascinated with doing these one-offs, where what inspires you to a particular story? You've already told us this was about your great aunt, but you know, what triggers you off onto one of these standalone uh, novels? Well, I don't know. I mean, the Tuscan one, I suppose, was I I taught a workshop two summers in Tuscany. So um, I was very aware, you know, there were books that I read very aware of how the Tuscan towns suffered under German occupation. So, and I also read um, a, an autobiography of an English pilot who had come down in Italy and who had been hidden by a local woman at great danger to herself. So I had those stories and, you know, while I was there, I was very aware, I was making note of what do you see here? What do you smell here? What do you, all the things that bring a book to life. But um, uh, obviously it's the characters too. You want to write about someone who, in, in the case of the, the Venice sketchbook, of two women who are brave in spite of what life has thrown at them and who, um, who turn uh, tragedy into triumph in many ways. Um, and um, so, you know, it's... Uh, and then the chance to go and do research in Venice is not bad either. So. <laughs> no, it's not. But, you know, you, you're so experienced writing series and that comes with its own set of, um, of things that you have to do. You have to remember the ensemble cast. You've created characters. You can't really change them once you've said how old they are or, you know, or they have children or whatever. You can't go back and rewrite it. But it's also a lot of work to do world building per book. You know, when you're starting right at zero. So are you finding that right now to be as much or more fun than writing a series? You know, the nice thing about a standalone novel is you get to walk away at the end. Um, you can leave these people in what you hope will be a good place. And then you say, okay, that's that story done. Let's go somewhere else now. And then everybody will write to me and say, is there going to be a sequel to the Venice sketchbook, what's going to happen at the end to Caroline? And I want to know, I've had, you know, In Farley Field was the one I left an open ending to that I thought maybe we want to go back and because we had so many points of view and they were all doing different things. Maybe we could do something else with that. But um, the others I finished in what I hope was a good place and then I walked away. Whereas when you're doing a series, the nice thing is each time you go back, it's like, it's like a family reunion. You know everybody, you know what sort of things they say, you know what they're going to do in certain circumstances. So it's much easier. Um, and it's very, very comforting to know that I can handle this. I know what these people are like. Um, yeah, the only thing is you don't want to get it samey. You don't want to have, you know, you don't want to have the same story repeated 18 times. You want to surprise them. You want them to grow. You want them to be really challenged. You want them to suffer. And so coming up with that for each of the books is, is, is a challenge. But um, the standalones are really nice because you can build this world. All the little details of Venice and all the little details about what you find there and the festivals and everything else, and you can walk away again. I like that. Well, yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I, I, there was a tremendous popularity for books like Mary Stewart or, as I mentioned earlier, Victoria yeah. Holt or, um, you know, where where they wrote you it, it, there was it was kind of a brand in a sense that you you had a certain set of expectations coming to it as a reader um that you would i mean mary stewart for example there were there was almost always two men and you know you weren't sure which of them was going to turn out to be yeah. the, the stalwart one the good guy and which yeah. one of them was going to turn out to be the betrayer yeah. and and when that when that was was written um, there wasn't really a great reason to follow them into the future life. As you say, she brought them to a place and left them generally a yeah. good place, uh, yeah. but not always. And, um, you know, the English writer, the mystery writer, Josephine Tay is yeah. a bit like that. If you yeah. think about, you know, her, her yeah. books, yes. even though she had a repeating character, they, they were much more 
um, of a standalone. In fact, the franchise affair, Brad Farr, yeah. um, you know, was over, over and done. The thing I think would be hard if you're writing a series and, and you found a way around that is that occasionally a story might come to you where the characters in the series that you have established couldn't possibly pursue the story. It just wouldn't fit everything you have already, yeah. you know, um, designed for them. That's the, that's the reason for standalones. You know, when you're writing a series, and obviously I've been writing both series for quite a few years, I would come up with ideas. Like I'd love to do something in Farley Field, for example, I would love to do something about the British aristocrats in World War II and those who are helping Hitler. Um, but then that wouldn't fit into my Georgie books for many, many years. So, you know, so I have to put these little things on the back. But in fact, I came up with the idea for In Farley Field in the early 2000s. And I wrote what was the first chapter and I sent it to my then agent. And she came back to me and she said, um, uh, nobody's interested in World War II and uh, nobody, and I think it's rather insulting that you're writing about people having a nice easy time in England when everybody's suffering so much on the continent. So I put it aside. I did get a new agent, but... Um, <laughs> Obviously so, right. But, um, and you know, for years I put it aside and then I felt I was, I was established enough in my career that I could because it's, it's a risk to take it, to do a standalone. If you've got two series that people love, it's a risk to do a, sca a standalone that people might not love. And I don't think the standalones have necessarily sold as well as the series, but I wanted to do it. I showed my agent and um, she thought she liked it. Um, and we showed it to both my publishers, both of whom didn't want to touch it. One said, one said it's too far from your brand. And the other one said, it's not funny. I, well, no, it's not funny. It's about the middle of World War II. So, um, so we went, we, my agent said, I know who'd love this. And that was Danielle Marshall at Lake Union. And I've been blissfully happy with her ever since. So. Well, it's wonderful that you've reached a point where you can have it all. <laughs> you've got <laughs> clear. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So you, you and Claire together are keeping Molly Murphy going. You're having a great time with Lady Georgie and her family. And you get to write these standalone stories as they occur to you. I mean, you're, the pace at which you have been producing work is really prodigious. So obviously, your mind is constantly churning out story ideas. I'm not very good at being bored, you know. Um, I'm the sort of, per what would I do if I didn't write every day? I'm the sort of person, we, we go on holiday and the first morning I sit there under an umbrella, and let someone bring me a pina colada. And by the next day I'm saying to, to, to John, okay, there's a Spanish class at 10 and then we can take out a canoe. And then by lunchtime we would, you know, I've got the day planned. So that's me. I have to accept that I, I need to be busy and I do have ideas. I, I think that that's something I'm really blessed with is that, I keep coming up with things I'd love to write about. And I think, oh, wouldn't it be fun to, you got me started on something that I'm toying with for the future, not, not this year, not next year, but, which is Australia. Um, you know, I, my parents lived in Australia. I got married in Australia. I know Australia very well. And it has that great vibe of its own that we, hasn't really been tackled that much. So I'd love to take one of my characters to Australia at some time. I think that's a wonderful idea. Well, you're very fortunate that, you know, you're an, a writer who's, um, who just has ideas bubbling all the time and you have the energy yeah. and, um, and enough, um, enough success with your publishers that you can, you can yeah. do all this, you know, yeah. it's, it's wonderful. I mean, we've been friends and doing this together for yeah. all the, yeah. almost 20. 30 years now, 25 anyway, I think. Yeah. And, you know, it's yeah. it's really been fun to watch because, I mean, I first met you when you were writing Evan, you know, in the, in the little world. Yeah, my first time at your bookstore, there was, there were, there were two men, there were Lewis and Monty and you, three people. <laughs> well, you're not alone. There are many authors who have had that same <laughs> experience. Not everybody, you know, gets to start with a bang. Um, and, and there, sometimes it takes a body of work, you know, not just one novel. Today, there's so much hype around, you know, an opening novel. Uh, I had a very interesting discussion with Gillian Flynn and Dennis Lane a couple weeks ago, which you can watch on our Facebook yeah. Zoom, about how difficult, or, or not, let me rephrase that, about 
how to follow a hugely successful book. What is it yeah. that you would do? Dennis with Mystic River, Gillian yeah. with Gone Girl. Yeah. Um, and that's a different path than if you write, you know, a number of books and you gradually acquire um, yeah. a loyal a loyal audience. So there are all kinds of different paths towards yeah. success. Yeah. Why don't we see if Patrick King would like to emerge from the yes. black hole called the poison pen? There he is. Oh. Hi. Do we have questions? All right. We do actually have a few questions coming in from the audience. Um, one of which came in early in the session. And um, Reese, some of the audience wants to know what you're currently reading during the pandemic. Um, well, during the worst of the pandemic, I went back to all my old favorites. Um, I, I read all the Mary Stuarts, as, as first Barbara can tell you. I read, I read the whole Chronicles of Narnia. I read, I, I've, emer I've emerged from that now. And now one of my problems is that when you get known for a certain genre, people ask you to blurb all the time. So a lot of the things I've done, I've just, uh, 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 things I've just blurbed. Um, I've just read a book by, um, Tessa Arlen's new book about the royal governess, which was very interesting because it's not a mystery. It's, it's a, just a, a historical, really biopic sort of thing of, of uh, uh, Princess Elizabeth's governess and what happened to her. Um, uh, I can't remember, I, I, it's around somewhere, but I can't see what the title was. I'm now in the middle, finally, of, of Louise Penny's um, latest one, um, All the Devils Are Here, the one that takes place in Paris. Um, I just haven't had time to read it before, but I'm reading that now. I found until I feel a bit more secure with my vaccines that I didn't want anything that was too disturbing. Uh, you know, I needed something that was secure enough. And of course, Louise and Gamache are, are completely, uh, a completely wonderful universe always where you, you know, again, you know all the characters, you see uh, their son and daughter in Paris and, uh, uh, his old friend and you know so it's it's always it's again it's like visiting old family each time so comfort reading essentially comfort is what you're saying reading, absolutely yes um hank philippi ryan would like to know did you know the whole story of the venice sketchbook before you started and she was hoping you could talk a little bit about your drawings Oh, my drawings, yeah. Um, no, I didn't know the whole story to start with. I knew, I wasn't quite sure what might happen to, I didn't even know whether it might be happy, a happy ending for Letty or a sad ending for Letty. I knew she would go to Venice. I knew she would meet someone. I knew she would fall in love. I knew she would be trapped there in World War II. And I knew Caroline would uh, have some sort of impetus to go and find out what happened to her aunt. That I knew that much. So. Um, uh, we went on from there and it was only really when I was writing those last scenes, which are really harrowing for me to write, you know, when you, when you have a character you like and you know you're going to make them suffer, it's hard, it's, it's really hard, and, um, but that's the, way, that's the way it went, so uh, that filled in, and the whole, you know, when you're in a place, uh, bits of the story fill in. I was a, across on the Lido, which is the island where the casino is and the beaches and, and and I walked past this this villa that was really dilapidated and old. And I thought, oh, I wonder who lived there. I wonder who lived there in World War II. And I thought, oh, what if she was a contessa and she was a patron of the arts? And then I thought, what if she was a Jewish contessa and a patron of the arts? And so therefore um, the contessa comes in and plays a big part in the story. So she hadn't been planned to start with. So I love things like that when someone just walks in and says, hello, here I am. But the sketches, everywhere I go, whenever I go on a travel, I take a sketchbook and a little box of watercolors and, and pens with me. And I sit and sketch everywhere. And, um, uh, you know, that's the way that a, a trip really means something to you. You can take all the photos in the world, but when I look back and I see a sketch I've done, I know exactly where I was sitting and what was going on and everything because you're so focused on what you're drawing. And um, so uh, I do, I paint watercolors too. And um, uh, I, perhaps I'm, that's why all my, <laughs> perhaps that's why all my characters are artists. I'm a frustrated artist. You know, I probably should have gone to art school instead of anything else. Did you have any formal art training, Reese, or is this something that you've just developed on your own? I've, I've, take, I've taken a few, you know, 
evening classes at colleges. I've, you know, I've taken a couple of watercolor courses. I took one with a woman in Marin County where I live and she's a brilliant artist. She was an awful teacher. It was a plein air class and she'd go out with us and she'd say, oh, I see a great swath of trees coming down to the lake. And hers would look like a great swath of trees coming down to the lake. And mine would look like a green smudge here and a blue smudge there. <laughs> so I gave up on her. But um, occasionally you get a teacher who really can teach you something. And then, and, and then you go, oh, this is really good. But um, uh, no, I think I have to do classes because else you don't do it. You, you know, it, you need the motivation for working and, and showing somebody. But when you pay, I did a lot of painting during the pandemic, actually. I, um, because when you're painting, you're completely focused. You can't think of anything else. You can't worry. You can't, you know, you, it, you, you're just there. You're working on that piece. And that's three or four hours that you're sitting and working without thinking of anything else. So it's very comforting. So a few more questions in regards to your sketches. Do you think you'd ever have like an illustrated edition, for instance, of your, of your books? Or would you like to see that happen? Um, or a collection of your sketches? Um, I thought about, I, I'm guest of honor at Malice next year. I think I will frame one of my sketches and give it to them to auction off maybe. That will be, um, uh, I don't think, my, my work is, is, you know, my work's amateurish because you, you've seen the one, I'm, I sketch, I don't do fantastic paintings. Um, you get sketches from me, so. Um, but, um, so I can't like, see myself illustrating books ever. But um, it was very nice. I'm very, very flattered that that's on the cover of the book. It's, it's a nice thing to have. Maybe it will be a trend. Maybe now your publishers will. You know, I, I was going to mention that I think that um, the Amazon group of publishing um, has done a really great thing. This is, um, I'll show it again, but um, there are other covers where you don't normally think when you, we in the bookstore, right, PK? We don't normally think when the books come in, that will take off the covers and look at the at the at the book without the cover. Yeah. But I'm now deciding that it's important to do that um, because there are lovely treats that can be hidden behind the dust jacket and um, and make it a, a nicer book to own. I just am not programmed that way, so it's been interesting to see it happen. I guess I, because I'm so used to mylaring everybody's books. Yeah. that I, I tend to notice those little surprises and those little uh, yeah. neat tricks that they do, but most people wouldn't. Um, Reese, people were also wondering about your book club uh, or your books and being so good for uh, book clubs. And so I, I have a question myself. What do you think it is about your books that uh, uh, attracts book clubs and are so good for book club groups? Um, well, there's a lot of things to talk about. There, obviously, the setting is is a lot to talk about. Um, two two different time periods in some of my books. Why would you know what was similar about those time periods? What was different? What was you know what was what can what parallels can you make between the lives of the um, of the two heroines? And um, you know, in this one, in the Venice sketchbook, an immediate question is. Um, why doesn't Caroline go and get her son from when he's with his father, you know? And so I think I write very human characters that have lives outside of, you know, some of my books are mysteries, but my characters have lives that are quite, um, quite identifiable. You know, people, people have children, people lose relatives. Um, and so uh, there's a lot to talk about in, in would I do this, would I do that, you know, in, in The Tuscan Child. Would I have taken that risk to go and save Hugo? And um, uh, you know, so so I think yeah, I think there is a lot to talk about, and and, and moral ambiguities too are always good to discuss, aren't they? But is this the right thing to do? Is that the right thing to do? In in Farley Field, what would have driven the the, the perpetrator to do what he did? I'm not telling you anymore in case you want to read the book. Are there more? Questions, Patrick? I think that uh, ties up a lot of great compliments. Uh, people really love your books and love your work. Oh, um, yeah. So many, so many nice. When you're done with this, I, I think 
uh, you'll need to go through and read a lot of these because they're just really lovely. A lot that you've impacted so many people's lives and uh, have helped them through the pandemic. So thank you. That's, you know, that was an amazing thing that I have heard again and again and again. I've got letters from people saying, your, your books have helped me through a very difficult time. You know, there are people who've been isolated alone, shut up alone in an apartment somewhere. And um, I think we've all been really worried. I know I, I had this underlying, that's why I read the comfort books, underlying worry for a year. Like I'm going to be really careful, but what if I make one mistake and that one mistake kills my husband? You know, that's, that's the sort of thing that hung over our heads for a whole year. And so, I've had a lot of people say to me, I've been through the whole Royal Spider series again, and I've been through the whole Molly series again, and it's really comforting to go back and see them. So, you know, I think for a writer, it's rather humbling. You think when you're writing a book, you're writing a book to entertain, and to think that you, uh, you, you're actually doing a little bit of good when you write the book is rather, is rather a special thing, I think. It's, um, feels, it, it, feels, it feels really nice to know that you can make a bit of difference. And that's one of the reasons during the whole of the pandemic, I kept my Facebook page so active. I literally posted almost every day on Facebook because I realized that the people who were on my Facebook page needed to talk. Um, they were people who were shut up alone and um, they were people who were scared and um, just like me. So I had a lot of discussions on my Facebook page about the most mundane of things about, I hate ironing, I'm not good at ironing. And then I'd get 300 comments like, well, I like ironing, I'm really good at it. Well, I hate ironing too. But people, so I deliberately did things that touched everybody's life so we could all chat about them. And I think that turned out to be very important. Well, you've already mentioned, Reese, that you, know, you create a family when you're writing in the two series. Uh, you create, well, three series really, because you yeah. know I've, I've read all the Evan books as you wrote them, so. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that that's a wonderful thing for people to um, to step into is, you know, um, the embrace of a family when when times are difficult and to follow them along. And, and as you say, your characters are very human. They're not they're not superheroes. You know, they're not super villains. Um, and and so it's very comforting to spend time with them and and. You know, there is humor, um, not so much in the standalones, but certainly the Lady Georgie books yeah. are um, infused with humor. I mean, you obviously adore Queenie, you oh, know, yeah. who uh, is a source of constant amusement. Yeah. And, um, you know. I love, I love writing about Fig and making her be so awful. You know, she's, um, she's a lot of fun too. But yeah, people write to me all the time. And it's funny, nobody ever writes to me and says, well, I found the... The, the plot in that last book was really clever, that twist at the end. They write to me and they say, I love Queenie, I love Grandad, you know, I, I love uh, Zuzu, you know, they, they, they become very fond of the characters. Oh, but I don't think, I didn't think that that's a comment on your plotting, which I think is very good. It's just that, you know, they're, they're obviously wanting to spend time with the characters. But I also think that you've been over the years, because I've read all of your books, You've been very good about not repeating stories, uh, not, um, you know, there's no sense of recognition, you know, when I'm starting one thinking, oh, she's already done that, or, you know, it'll go this way. So, you know, you've been brilliant about maintaining characters and landscapes, which are su super important. I read for landscape as much as I do for character, because yeah. like you, I love to travel and, you know, that's a real joy. But you also <laughs> always deliver a good story. You know, I, I actually, I write the book that I want to read, but it's not sitting on a shelf, so I go and write it. Um, <laughs> that seems like a really wizard plan. Well, on that note, let me salute you once again. Oh, and thank you, my dear. Happy and book lunch. Um, the official public, publication day is Tuesday, as uh -huh. I've said. And as I've also mentioned, and will again, you can see from the little sign here that Reese has been in and signed all of our books. And if you have a um, personalization request, since Reese will be in town for a little while longer, um, you could certainly make that and um, 
and yeah, we'll I'll come over and sign it for you. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get the books done for you that way. So thank you for joining us. And enjoy the rest of your weekend. And Reese, I will see you we'll see for dinner. You yes. Bye. Right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in in the middle of a lovely Saturday afternoon. I appreciate it. Thank you again. Thank you, Patrick, for your usual excellent job. And bye. Bye. bye.